Hello, and welcome back to The Great Game. I'm Patrick Doyle. And I'm Jack McNamee. And today we're talking about design, concept to game day, and the process that we go through. Um, before we get started in this uh, episode, I thought I'd hand over to Jack for some mega game news. Yeah, so first off, um, uh, just an update. The True North Mega Games Design Symposium is coming up this weekend um, uh, on Saturday the 30th at 12 p.m. UK time. I'm super excited for that one. It will be 9 p.m. at night for us here, so I'll just be checking it out briefly probably before I'll have to head to bed. Um, But a lot of interesting stuff in terms of um, they're going to be displaying a gallery of different mega game concept art. Um, Lots of cool stuff there, so I'm excited to check it out. Also um, coming up this weekend is the second playtest for our online mega game that we've been working on, Dark and Stormy Night. Um, so that game is um, it's going to be the second playtest. It's going to include um, hopefully a, a, almost a couple of dozen players, and we'll be scaling it all out from the last playtest, taking on board some feedback we got, and um, playing it over the weekend more or less to see how it all runs in the long form um, of multiple days. So looking forward to that. And if you haven't signed up already, you, you, there might be still spots available when this goes live. So um, check it out. There'll be a link below. Definitely get into it. Super excited to do that. And the main game itself probably won't be too long after that one. Um, and speaking of that, uh, we uh, also wanted to mention another mega game that will be happening on the 6th of June, an online Quidditch mega game, which is super interesting and exciting um, because it's using a similar thing that we're doing in Dark and Stormy Nights, where it will be taking one action every day for a couple of weeks on a website. Um, I'm sure we'll have a link to that website in the description. I'm really interested to check it out. It's um, by one of the designers of The World Turned Upside Down, which is a really cool American Revolution mega game in the past. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out if you're interested on the 6th of June. Right um, on with the episode then. Right, so today um, on the podcast we are talking about how we go about designing mega games from the ground up. Um, We're going to be running through a few things. First of all, um, probably most importantly, how what inspires us to get into designing a new mega game. And from there we'll talk about the tools that we use, um, the order in which we run through the different components of a game and how we design those. Um, when we put pen to paper and start creating all those formal um, components and documents like rule books, um, how we pull together a team of um, designers or collaborators to help us. And then we'll just slightly touch on the actual production of um, different game components and assets. We'll go delve into um, playtesting a little bit and how we how we do or don't do that. And we'll try and finish up with just a few tips that we've learned along the way over the years. Um, so just to kick us off, Jack, could you maybe give us an in- insight into what inspires you when you've got a new game on the table? Absolutely. Um, so I feel like... Uh... This is maybe the bit that people will need the least help on because I feel like everyone I've talked to has an idea for a game of some kind or a mega game. Um, A lot of things inspire me. Uh, Really what kicks me off on a lot of mega games is often um, a board game, actually, Uh, like um, uh, Cosmic Encounter or Root, the tabletop game. A lot of those really um, inspire me to try to take the central ideas of that and put it in a mega game um yeah it's usually for me that kind of um mechanical stuff more or uh, the other uh, thing that does inspire me is like a a a really solid theme that i'm really excited about um yeah what about you patrick yeah I'm, i'm glad you said that because the um board games are definitely uh an inspiration to me now, but when we when I first started with the Mega Games in Sydney uh, in 2014, I was actually really, I was pretty much on the outside of the the modern board game community, and I wasn't up with a lot of the hip new <laughs> games, and I didn't realize what was going on there. So um, it's funny the first few games that I did design, uh, they were more inspired just by um, very basic mechanics um, and themes that I've really pulled from fiction a lot of book or tv show or movie inspired things um 
and from there, really, as the years went by and I designed more games, I've definitely um, turned my attention more to board games as far as mechanics go. And um, as far as themes go, uh, themes and kind of narrative and uh, player decision making, I've actually looked a lot into video games. And that's where a lot of um, little ideas have come to me. For example, the uh, 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 As the Fire Dies, which I ran last year, which I designed last year, I should say. Um, was very heavily inspired on the game by um, called Frostpunk. And um, a few of my previous games have had a lot of components in them that have been inspired by mechanics from the Total War video games. Um, these days, I find when we're designing games that are a bit more role-play focused, um, role-playing games, tabletop role-playing games for sure, is uh, definitely inspiration. Absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think really it's all about beg, borrow and steal, right? Just steal ideas from wherever you can. Um, yeah, mm. so usually, so uh, I, a couple of ideas which I haven't progressed further on, I'll just talk about one of them. Um, uh, I was really inspired by the board game Cosmic Encounter. The uh, big thing with that board game is that every player gets their own special weird uh power that they get to use uh so it's very asymmetric everyone's very different and that was an idea i hadn't personally i ha still haven't really explored too much in a mega game uh, in my mega games typically people have started out basically on the same footing there's not too there's a couple of differences but basically you're all using the same stuff so the idea of having this space mega game where all of the alien races are completely different and completely unique and you don't know what the players over on the other side of the room are doing or what they are they're very alien to you that was really interesting to me so that, that's an example there of like getting inspiration from a board game i think that tends to be the dichotomy i think people either get inspiration from a story or from a set of mechanics and both of those are awesome yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that one in particular sounds really interesting. And I actually think now, uh, thinking about it, we could probably do a whole episode just talking about, you know, broken dreams and ideas that <laughs> never came to fruition. I, I think um, that I've is, the, got sorry, I'll cut in. I think that is the thing is that, uh, you know, I've got 20 <laughs> mega game ideas for everyone that makes it to the table. And I think, I don't know, do you feel like you're the same way? Yeah, definitely. And to the point where I think um, I might have mentioned in a previous episode, I, I've got this disease now where I can look at nearly anything in life, um, you know, from just like from little things like agriculture, for example, or mm. running a business or or what have you. And I just see that there's a mega game there to run. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It, so my backlog is just yeah, it's ridiculous. I've, I've lost control of it at this point. <laughs> yeah, the only advice I would really give to people is um, just, uh, well, what I do at least anyway, is you start a Google Doc and write a bunch of ideas down and don't critique yourself at the idea stage, right? Don't let yourself think like, oh, well, I don't know if we can implement this. Oh, is this really going to work? Um, you know, the idea stage is not the time for that thinking. Just... Uh, when you are interested in an idea and excited about it, like go for it, write it down. And later is the point when you start going, okay, how does this actually work? Is this actually feasible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree. And um, very regularly you'll reach that later point and you'll decide uh, this isn't for me or no, I'm going to park this for now. Or uh, if you're like me, you'll find something bigger and better to start on. Um, but that's okay. I think you're right. Keeping all those ideas putting them down, keeping them somewhere, knowing when to revisit them and just waiting for the right the right alignment of the stars, I guess, of your ideas and your creativity and um, just whatever else you've got going on to inspire you. Um, but you, speaking of just sort of throwing ideas down into Google Docs, um, we were going to talk a little bit about what tools we use. Do you have any special sort of um, process that you go through in preparing uh, for the design process, like uh, getting the tools you need, programs that you use, uh, post-it notes on the wall? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Look, the, <laughs> the first thing I usually do is uh, create a uh, Google Doc on Google Drive uh, because it's amazing and it goes anywhere with you and you can type on it on any computer, right? Um, mm. I The first thing I do is just random dot points of ideas uh, and then I usually progress to making a, uh, to basically stealing the format of a rule book for one of my other mega games mm -hmm. 
and just typing out the basic stuff that I'm thinking of in each page. So um, the rule book format I usually have is it starts out uh, with a table of contents. It talks about the basic concept for one page. Then it tells everyone what the teams are and what the basic gameplay stuff is. So I kind of go through that, filling that in with basic dot points of ideas and then refine it from there. That's that's my first step, at least. What about you? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'm glad you said that. It's very similar. I always have to set up a, a new Google Drive uh, folder. I get pretty wild. Um, you can ask some of the collaborators that I've worked with. I get pretty wild with file structures. So I've got yeah. a little place here that I'll put my drafts and character ideas or teams ideas in. And then I've got a document here and a folder there. And I start getting the spreadsheets out. Um, but yeah, off the bat, um, that concept document is really important. And Google Drive, um, Google documents or any other sort of suite of online tools that you can use the spreadsheets and word processing and access it anywhere they're really useful um as far as um other tools that i use i have to admit that there was a time um, i think as the fire dies and for the crown both last year where i did have a board up at in my apartment because i didn't have many guests <laughs> and i had a lot of uh I did have post-it notes up and I had post-it notes with just single words on them, which were tasks I had to work through. This was a little bit later down the track and mm. this isn't a, you know, it's not a new idea or anything. It's pretty, it's a sort of a project management approach, but it was just tasks I had to do with yellow ones, meaning something I had to write, like a document, like a brief or something. Um, pink ones were um, graphic design jobs I had to do, that kind of thing. And having it all fleshed out and slowly moving those post-its to a completed box, you know, um, it was very gratifying and it was it gave, gives you a really sort of sense of purpose um, and, for, and sort of accomplishment and momentum. And you can you can do the same you can get the same outcome from a, a check a checklist or like a shopping list kind of thing there's apps that you can use like trello that kind of thing mm. but once i get past the first um initiation of like getting a concept of the game having those tasks laid out um really helps me personally but uh they always change as you go as well those lists lists of tasks oh yeah, yeah yeah the the lists never stick i usually make <laughs> a um when I've gotten a bit further on, I make a um, uh, spreadsheet in Google Drive with all the called like to do with the stuff that needs to be yes. done, and then just like um, uh, and shade things in green once they're done. Yep. yep. Um, pretty simple, and it, you know it needs to be simple, really. Yeah, well, simple, uh, but also it's very clear. Like you've got a clear visualization, which I think helps a lot of people. Um, of what you've achieved, what you're doing and what you have to work on next. So, you know, you don't just get stuck one day where you've got the big picture in your head, but you don't know what's next. You need to start breaking that down into small tools um, or small, you know, tasks. Um, but the last thing I was going to ask you, um, I've done a lot of graphic design with my previous games and I've been sort of teaching myself stuff over the years. Um, my main, I have to shamelessly say one of my main tools is PowerPoint, <laughs> but um, I do use Photoshop as well. Um, do you do much other sort of graphic design or any other visual design for your games? And what what, what do you use? Absolutely. I usually get a, a lot of people to help out with that, um, for sure. I'm not normally the lead on it. But what I usually... that's So first of all, that's usually... Uh, I leave that for like the very end of the process, obviously, mm. right? Um, usually, what I, I start... Uh, first of all... Before I start doing the graphic design, I will have a Google Doc of a rules Bible, like one single Google Doc that has all of the rules for the game in one place, like a single source of truth, right? Um, hmm. Because obviously you can have, like, you know, in the course of, like, coming up with ideas, I'll have all the post-it notes and the little bits and scraps of stuff all over the place that has all the rules, um, and, like, scattered everywhere, um, but when I want to get to actually, uh, the art and graphic design stuff, I want all of the rules in a single place so that there's one single thing that you're like, okay, here's how the game works. You don't need to look at 50 different documents, right? Yep. Um, uh, usually I also have a spreadsheet of all of the cards that the game will need. Um, so it'll, you know, for example, let's say we're doing in Watch the Skies, there's a bunch of technology cards, right? 
Um, so I'll have a spreadsheet of each of those with the text and number of cards and that kind of info. Mm. Um, what you can do from there. Um, so first of all, I usually get a gr good friend of mine, um, Gordy Higgins, uh, to help with the graphic design of the rule book. He's awesome at it. Um, so I'm not, I won't go into the details of graphic design there. He's got <laughs> it. Um, with cards, one of the awesome things you can do if you, uh, so I use uh, Adobe Illustrator and I get a lot of help um, from my friend, Jason Coetzer. Um, but what you can do, if you have a spreadsheet and Adobe Illustrator, you can set up a data merge, which is a thing that um, automatically takes all of the info on that spreadsheet and converts it into cards. Um, the awesome thing about that is that instead of making a bunch of separate cards, you can edit the stuff on the spreadsheet. Like if you're like, uh, I think these 50 cards, they should be priced at $3 instead of $4, you know, whatever it is, you can update it on the spreadsheet and then run the data merge and it'll bloop, transfer into the thing. I won't go into the details of, of how to do that on this podcast. I think it'd be it'd make it a bit too long. Yeah. Um, but that's a huge, huge help in letting you like change stuff very quickly. Because um, usually I find I'm changing stuff right up until like the last last minute that everything <laughs> is getting printed out. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, I was my, I was blown away when you told me about that. I'm glad that I've discovered it now. It's an awesome feature. And um, yeah, having having all your data organized, like you've been saying, the way that you prepare your the information for your cards in a spreadsheet, that kind of thing. Um, it's all really simple stuff, but it's it's something that you want to get right, um, or at least have organized early on, like you said. Things always change as you go, um, always, nearly always up until the last minute, but it's good to just have everything organized like that. It makes life a lot easier when you are making those little tweaks. Um, regarding the actual design process, um, I thought we'd just try and delve in a little bit to the, the different components of it all. We need to, when we're running through designing a game, um, I personally break things up into different sort of chunks or or components so usually you're going to have to do some design work around defining what teams are um, and what the roles are and what players are doing you've got mechanics you've got really hard mechanics that are going to involve dice and chance or cards or whatever like strategy tactics um, soft mechanics that are more, more about diplomacy and that kind of thing how do you um, what's what do you have a general process of how you run through those things in the design process or is it all just a jumble Sure. So usually, well, first of all, what I um, do is I'll have a bunch of different mega game uh, random bits and pieces of ideas um, in order to isolate uh, which one I actually want to do. I kind of look at a bunch of those ideas, which I've just randomly scribbled out just here and there and kind of look at like which one is uh, the most feasible and the most exciting to me are the two things, right? Um once I have isolated that specific idea that I'm like, all right, let's actually push this to make it a thing. The big things that I think of first are usually what is the player going to do in this game, right? Teams and roles, like what teams there are, stuff like that, I usually don't deal with yet. It's like, yeah, what actions can the player take and how is that going to work? So in a game like Watch the Skies, for example, the first thing I would look at is the war map, the science table, uh, the, and the UN, right? Because those are the three big things that players do. Is So how are they going to attack each uh, attack aliens and stuff on the war map? How are they going to research stuff in the science center? And how are they going to deal with stuff at the UN? So if I was making up a new game where, like this cosmic space game, right? I'd be like, okay, what are these players going to do? And I'd be like, all right, I want them to be able to explore new planets i want them able to have a diplomacy element where they're talking and making friends with new aliens and mm -hmm. i want there to be combat where they have blow each other up in space so i'd look at those three things and figure out how i want them to work usually i do that by stealing a board game mechanic of some time of some kind i'll be like all right they're playing yahtzee for this one you know stuff like that yeah um yeah so that's the first thing i look at how about you pat well, it's uh, it's interesting. I um, I was thinking about this a bit before and tried to put my process out, you know, 
you know, chronological way. It's not always the same, but it was interesting for me to realize that I kind of go through, I do go through a process almost just naturally. Um, the first thing that I do is lay out a concept. So I usually write a document. I remember for As the Fire Dies, this document was 20 pages long, which is just ridiculous. And it was a lot of rambling. And my my approach to those documents is I never use the backspace. I don't stop nice. putting ideas down. And I usually end up with um, vague sections, which like you just said, uh, you know, something like uh, the players. So for As the Fire Dies, um, for example, people had to manage resources. One of those resources was called um, rations and one was called food and you could turn food into rations and um, it was much more beneficial for the community if you did that, but it took time to do it. I didn't, I hadn't got that sort of spelled out at the start. So in my concept document, it would have said something along the lines of um, all players have a resource, which is something like food. Um, they need this to survive every game turn or day and there are ways in which they can um, share that with the community however it takes time and other resources so there is a moral dilemma about keeping food for yourself or sharing it with the community and that little idea then spread into a mechanical design down the track but it started with that little concept and i had no idea what the mechanics would look like um, but that's where i started so i get that concept down um, and what i've noticed i do after that is I always jump straight into teams and roles at the start, which I don't know if this is the right place to start, but I find I always need to define what the, who the players are and what they're doing and where they fit into, how, they, how they're going to interact and what responsibilities they have. And those things start as, um, you know, using Watch the Skies as an example, they start as general ideas, like the military player is responsible for operational components of that team. That then leads me to the next thing I design, which is what I call jurisdictions, which is essentially those little areas of the game, like the science game and the war map and the UN. That's what I call jurisdictions. And right. I kind of have those defined after I've sussed out in vague terms, what do I want the players doing? So if I have players who I want doing a war game, then one of the jurisdictions has to be that war game. So it's sort of a flow on effect from that. That makes um, sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think there's definitely a big... So I th I think reflecting on it, I end up being a more mechanics-focused uh, designer, at least at the start, which is kind of weird because I've always thought of myself as like a theme guy. But usually mm. the first thing I will do is, yeah, I'll define those different sections of the game, the jurisdictions, and steal a board game for the basic mechanics of it. You know what I mean? Like, I'll be like, okay, uh, like God Emperor is a good example. I'm like, okay, the... War map is diplomacy. I'm going to steal mechanics from diplomacy for that. I'll have an espionage bit of the game, which is stolen from um, Android Netrunner, the, mm. the, the card game. Um, and I'll have a uh, deployment, uh, uh, a negotiation part of the game, which will basically be kind of a model UN kind of thing. Um, and of course, usually I'm not, I, obviously with God Emperor specifically, I wasn't alone in any of this. I was chatting a bunch with um, uh, Melissa, who was uh, the co-designer for like the initial stretch of that. Usually I'm chatting a bunch to people about that. So it's by no means a one man job mm. or anything, but usually the stuff that I'm thinking about, I guess, is mechanics driven, even though it's initially inspired by theme. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, well, that's that's what I mean. I found it really fascinating when I started questioning myself how I do it. Um, what I what I learned is I do that part. I get the concept. I have the teams and the people. So I really, it's like people first, and then what are they doing, mm. um, which is the jurisdictions, um, and then I go to I guess what I would say is the what are they doing it with, and that's when I start designing things like metrics, like team team metrics or um, stats or resources, like things that they can earn in the game and use, like currency. Mm. And then it's after that point that I actually go into the hard mechanics and start figuring out, okay, so how, how does that operational game work? I've sussed out that it, it is a, a broad game where people move armies around a map and they can, if they meet, then they can fight and there's different types of units and stuff. But it's sort of further down the track that I come back to it and say, all right, got this idea i really like it time to figure out how it actually works are there dice involved are there cards and then and i think it was f funny you said you always thought of yourself as a narrative person because i do as well 
but mm. it's after I've sort of sussed out those hard mechanics that on my list of things comes the, the narrative, the world building, and then finally at the very end is sort of the player briefs and their goals and their identities. So all that narrative and storytelling actually comes last for me, which I found interesting, but uh, it happens to be <laughs> the way it is. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of, I mean, it's a very rough process, isn't it? But I yeah, think, yeah. yeah, I think the the biggest things that I would worry about are, uh, what is the game about and what are the players doing and why? Uh, mm -hmm. Those three things are very connected, right? So with, with God Emperor, I think the game, uh, the player, uh, the game is about espionage, diplomacy, and war. And those are the three things the players are doing, right? Okay. Uh, with the space game, the idea was I want it to be our exploration, um, alliances and diplomacy and finding new people and combat right like th those are the kind of the big things it's about and that will inform what it actually is and at the start of it i would actually say you know it depends on what type of person you are and what type of designer you are but don't feel the need to drill down into detail yet if you want to be like okay there's some kind of game where people um make alliances and i'll figure out what that is later but it is important that there's some kind of aspect to this game where people talk to each other and make friends right we'll figure out what it is later but that's there yep. and then we'll focus on you know the, the other stuff like having things at a basic level is really good yeah yeah definitely that's that's where i find myself ending up quite a lot with just little little tidbits little side notes just saying this part of the game it will be about players negotiating and influencing each other um mm -hmm. and then i'll literally write this needs to be fleshed out and then i'll come back to it you know a month later um that's a great way to do things you just write on the card you're like this card does something you know, <laughs> you know yeah like, yeah yeah one thing I was going to actually raise about um, when you design different parts, one thing that I feel um, you nailed with God Emperor, at least from the player perspective, and it's the same thing that I find I often don't focus enough on or as much as I'd like to, is once you're designing all those players and their roles in the jurisdictions, then connecting the jurisdictions to each other, um, which doesn't always that happen. Is key, isn't it? And it doesn't have to happen, but I love it when it does happen. And I, I wondered, is that is that one sort of on your list of things to do, or did it just happen naturally with God Emperor? Definitely, it's it's a, it's a real focus for me. I guess where that came from is in playing Watch the Skies and running Watch the Skies for the first time. I found that a lot of those things can be very separate, and sometimes players reacted negatively to that. Like sometimes it can feel like the UN is very isolated and they're doing their own thing and it doesn't have an impact on the rest of the game. And I feel like the best moments in a mega game is where something you do has a huge impact, where you're like, all right, we sat down in the UN and, and decided to pass this resolution and that had a huge impact on the war map and on the science and on everything else that was going on, right? So having each of the, uh, having each of the sections connect in a really important way, I think that is super important for me. Um, in, in terms of like what, when I think about that stuff, I think, yeah, I, I first get the basic idea of what the section is doing and then the basic mechanics. And then I start to look at the connections, but it is, yeah, I think it is really important that the, all of the game is like a cohes cohesive whole. It's difficult to do though. It is like really tough because it, it results in a lot of weird and, and wacky interactions but i don't know i guess that's just part of designing a mega game yeah yeah i mean you're always going to end up with the with the, with the strange way in things interact or even despite your best efforts the way they don't interact and that might just not happen because the players are in you know focused on different things and mm. and that's fine um it always just stuck with me uh, when I did play God Emperor years ago, when the council game was interrupted by a military revolution and the, the, the players came in and threw the sword on the table and made a big thing out of it. And then um, it, it was just, it was awesome. It was so immersive. And so even though the mechanics connecting those two things are very light, it was, it made you feel like everything was part of the same sort of tapestry, um, which I think is just, I think it's unique. And I think it's like to mega games in general. And I definitely. think it's definitely something that's kind of on my, my hit list in future. Um, I, I think the question I would ask really when you're looking through, and this is maybe something further down the track when you're like refining things. 
Um, the question to ask is like, does everyone feel important and feel like they have an impact on what's going on? I, I think that's pretty important. I don't think it's okay if you have a, it's okay if the sections of the game don't necessarily need, they don't necessarily need to have a bunch of specific mechanical things that impact the other sections of the game. As hmm. long as you've answered that question, like, okay, I do feel like the people who are doing this particular bit of the game are going to feel important and are going to feel like they have an impact on stuff, uh, then I think you've done a good job, basically. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think what you said before just kind of wraps it up well. It's it's about who are the players in the, in the game? What's their role? What are they doing? And then, uh, yeah, then you, you flow on from that. What's the jurisdictions that they're in? What actions can they take? What's their purpose? And then by the end of all that, you have to be able to say, all right, do they all feel important? Do they play an important role? The rest will flow from there. Um, so I think that's, yeah, I think that's a pretty good place to start. The um, the last thing I was going to say, um, just on the, the point of different components of the design and, and where it all fits, one thing I've found myself doing lately is rewriting rule books, um, which we can get into in a sec about actually putting pen to paper and, and producing those documents. But um, yeah, I, I write these concept documents and then I start a draft rule book. And like you, like you, I, I pull out sort of general headings and throw them down into a document and explain what I want on each chapter. And then I start typing it all out and slowly mechanics get added. And then I do this wacky thing where I start again from scratch and write the whole thing from scratch in a different wow. order, in, in different, I mean, it's, I guess it's an editing process, mm -hmm. but I'm not editing the document. I start again and I don't know why I do that, but I, <laughs> yeah, just a tidbit. I usually, um, I usually go over the same document just again and again and again and delete stuff and mm. change stuff around and revise stuff all over the place until it is like totally rewritten at the end. But I, I kind of work in the same yeah thing i wouldn't i don't usually like go from the start and, and rewrite everything but i might delete a whole section and go no that's not working and, and revise everything or come back yeah. to it later and change stuff up a lot i think editing the same document over and over is what a sane person would do i just i don't get it <laughs> but it really helps me with the process and every time i do it i write this second iteration and all these things sort of click together so i guess it's just awesome. part of if how it I, helps, work. It helps. I think i think that's actually a cool idea i think you know the way um what uh, Stephen King does apparently is he writes a book and then he just leaves it in a desk drawer for a month while he goes and writes a second book. Right. And then once he's finished writing that second book, then he goes back to the first book because he's had enough time to just leave it alone for a bit and to re review it as if he's a stranger to it and mm. kind of go through it again from scratch or something. So it's yep. kind of interesting. Yeah, I think that's a, it's, it's about whatever works for you, right? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, yeah, unfortunately, the disclaimer for this episode probably will be that everyone's got their own process and their own ways of moving through the motions and you'll, you'll find your own. Um, but I guess it's hope I'm hoping it'll just be insightful that people can see what what we do and what we think. Um, I thought we could quickly talk about how we do all that design. You know, we've we've written up Google documents. We've got spreadsheets full of stuff. Um, how do you make the transition to formally producing documents that are going to go to the game? The, the rules briefings, um, the player briefings, the, you know, um, maybe maps or things that go on tables. How do you make that step? Usually the first thing I will do, even before I'm ready for it, is get other people involved and organize a either a like a rough play test or just a rough group discussion of it. Mm. Um, and usually that's not about, it, it's not actually about like play testing it or whatever. It's more like a motivation technique for myself it's because like, <laughs> if I'm like, Oh man, everyone's coming over next Saturday and they're going to try to chat to me about this mega game and I don't have anything done. Like that's a way for me to force myself to actually yes. work. On it. So getting other people involved soon as possible even before i'm ready for it uh, and setting a specific date they're like okay on this specific saturday we're gonna chat about it and and plan out the next steps that's the first thing i do in, a, in actually getting it to being a real life thing because it helps motivate me. And, and having other people on board it gives you a lot of 
energy at least like if other people are interested in it and go yeah that's cool like it gives you a lot of energy back that you're actually doing something that's interesting Mm, yeah um i think you've touched on something really important there which is enthusiasm um motivation the momentum that comes with other people uh having input um i'm i'm one who in my earlier design days because i was just way too deep in this stuff i would usually make my motivation um an announcement about the game and when it's going to be run uh, wow. long long before i was finished designing it um Whoa. yeah and i mean i had a lot of time but it was not a healthy process to go through but i totally agree with you that i am motivated by deadlines and timelines and knowing when um other people are going to be involved and need to be sort of briefed on things and mm. i think that's another thing if you're designing a game you need to know what motivates you and where you get your enthusiasm for me having these kind of conversations gets me enthusiastic um talk, talking to people about the game gets me enthusiastic playing other games gets me enthusiastic um but I need those things sort of pinpointed throughout the process. Otherwise, I will go into these lulls that we talked about at the start where you decide, oh, I'm not interested in that game anymore. I think motivation is the killer. Uh, motivation is, to me, like we talked a lot about design, obviously, but motivation is the thing that will make sure, are you going to run a mega game or are you not? That's it, right? Hmm. And ultimately, like, is, you know, like the aspects of like, well, how well do the rules fit together? How much does this work? How much does that work? Uh, that's important, but it's not as important as like, did you do the thing? Right, because ultimately, if you did the thing, it doesn't matter if it was absolute like <laughs> garbage. <laughs> if you did the thing, it is better than not doing the thing. Right, that that's it. Like that's that's the level. And if you manage to actually run a mega game, that's a huge achievement, and it'll mm. set you up much better for the next mega game. So knowing uh, ha- what motivates you and how can you tap into that stuff, that's really key. And so yeah, I- I'm exactly the same as you, Pat. For me um saying to people hey i'm making this mega game let's talk about it and then having those people will chat to me later and go oh so how's the mega game design going and i'll be like uh i haven't done anything Uh, like Mm. that's what motivates me and it pushes me to actually uh keep going yeah i think it's a very common thing and i think even more so in this kind of business or, or this activity a mega game is going to be a product that um, I've always described this as why I'm interested in role playing games. Mm-hmm. They're products where you are doing this creative process and then you're handing it over and you're immediately getting gratification back um, from your players rather than writing a book or making a movie or something like that, where it's a very long process of getting to that point. And I think it's important. It's, it's been really important for me to have that under, uh, have that realization and focus on that because I realize the thing that is motivating me is not that I like necessarily, I don't necessarily like the process of designing a mega game, but I'm really looking forward to having run a mega game and I want to be after the mega game. I want to be that, that day and then week and then maybe fortnight directly after I've run an event is where I do my best design work, I think. Because right. it's also fresh in my mind, um, yeah. So it's it's it's. I think yeah, it's really important that you do know, um, or you learn as you go what motivates you. Because it's it's the last thing these 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 mega games are really large, complex, and they're they're long term projects. And the last thing you want is to be pushing yourself along through that project um, when you're not really in your know, heart's not in it. So um, learning pretty early on about what motivates you is important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So for me, that's the, that's the process of, of once I've got a a decent idea of what it is, um, the process I run through is to do regular play tests or meetings and and chat about next steps and just refine the rules, refine them, refine them, refine them over and over. That's that, that's what helps me at least is, um, arranging just a bunch of regular times leading up to a deadline I've set myself that like, okay, hits, this is the point we're actually going to run it and uh, refining the rules for that. That's how I turn it from an idea into an actual thing for me. Yep. Yep. 
Um, I think what you've touched on there with getting people involved is definitely my formal step. Um, once I have a concept down, I usually move on to starting to produce what I call like the, the chunks of the game, the different mechanical components that are going into the rulebook document. And that's when I share that concept document with people. And yeah, like we've discussed, once you get people on board, they start asking questions and having ideas. Um, that's what moves me on. And I, I, I do the same. I start setting deadlines down through the next month or two about when I want things done and when I want to have meetings with people about the game and when I want to do the play testing. Um, <clears throat> so speaking of that, that heavy collaboration, did you want to just touch on briefly how you do collaboration? Like, do you get a full team together? When do you do it? And do you, do you divide up the tasks of what people are doing or is it kind of a free for all where everyone's just throwing ideas around and helping on everything? Yeah, it's usually pretty free for all. I don't have any specific, you know, like uh, roles usually. Um, yeah, usually I just start out chatting to friends and a couple of people. Once it's further along, I'll get together like a, a bunch more people for like a group meeting, like as many people as I can get. And then it'll go from there. It's a, it's a pretty woolly process for me, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, how about you? Yeah, I, it is about the same as me. I can't think back on like a single um, design process I've been through and say that they're all the same. Um, I think the biggest point that I've learned is that I'm not a great collaborator and I need to be, I need to collaborate a bit more. Um, and that just kind of comes from my work life as well. I'm usually a solo fixer rather than a, yeah. you know, a creative person. Um, That's fair. I can struggle with that sometimes too. Um for sure. Usually what I will do like, um, is set one. I often, I do set one part of the game aside and go like, all right, I'll leave that to you for a collaborator kind of thing. I know you guys have, uh, the Sydney May game is you have a, a discord that you do a lot of collaboration and work on, right? Uh, we did, we did. We set it up for specifically for, for the crown, because mm -hmm. that was actually an experiment in collaboration where, um, I got the control team together quite early and actually involved the entire control team in the design process um, mm. to specifically focus on the, the play testing stuff. Awesome. So um, it was quite early in the process of figuring out the hard mechanics that I got about a dozen or so people involved and some were more involved than others. Like they were more interested in that side of things, which was fine. Um, and it kind of just happened organically. They weren't split roles. It was just sort of an open free for all conversation at all times, throwing documents and ideas around. Um, and it's good. I mean, no one can deny that collaboration creates, you know, good creative outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. I think the more people you can get on board, um, the better. It's uh, it's really just about trying to find um, friends who are interested or even just chatting to people online if you can find it a lot of the initial people i found were on the board game geek forum mm. um so i'm that, that's a potential place to look for people who might be interested in helping you out or if you have facebook groups um that are from your location like we do have a uh, like a brisbane geek social club facebook group that i've used quite a bit to find people to collaborate with and who are interested in helping out or coming to the mega game uh, yeah, so it's really about finding as many people as possible. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, I think the only key thing, the prerequisite for me before going into that space is having a really clear concept, knowing what, yep. what you want out of it. Um, you don't need to know what all the components are going to look like and what every section of the game, sort of how it works and what mechanics are involved, but you just need a concept so that you are able to figure out when things creep out of scope and when people's ideas are, um, they're not necessarily bad, but they might be misaligned and they might be growing it into something that's too complicated for for the whole, like, you know, just for the purpose of ideas. Um, that's been one thing I've struggled with in the past. And even working solo, sometimes you can end up with too much complexity solely for the, the, the purpose of including ideas that you think are cool. And sometimes yeah, you need to realize... Um, it's not, you know, more isn't always going to be best. Sometimes it's, you need it to be slim and, and light and not, not too many co um, complex mechanics. Uh, so yeah, that would be the, the last thing I'd say just about that collaboration work, just knowing what you're going into, 
um, when you start talking to people. Uh, if it's too vague, then yeah, who knows what you'll end up with. Yeah, I completely agree. Having it just written down a core idea of what your game is about and a really clear idea of what it is about and what it isn't about, that's that's yep. that's really the key thing. And the, the mechanics will follow. And we've um, straying into that area of sort of collaborating with people. We've talked a bit about playtesting. Um, I think I've mentioned a few times in previous conversations that I have not done a lot of playtesting in the past, and it's probably a conversation we could go into pretty pretty deep on sometime. Um, but broadly, do you um, with God Emperor and um, We Are Not Alone and your other works that you're that you're chugging along through now? Do you have a process of when to start playtesting or how you do it? Or do you do you just wing it as it comes? Uh, absolutely. I think I'll I'll just go into it pretty briefly. I think it could be an episode in itself. But um, the I try to play test it as much as possible with a bunch of different people, as many different people as possible. Um, and usually, I try to make sure that I've designed a thing that I can play test with a very small amount of people. Mm. Uh, which can then go on to become something that will work for a mega game with a huge amount of people, right? Um, that can be a bit tricky to do it, about making something that's that scalable, um, but that's really the thing I focus on. So, like, uh, and you can see good examples of that this in the in the board game world, uh, where, for example, um, uh, let me think. Uh, there's quite a few games like, for example, Masquerade is a great game like this, which is a very simple, fun party game, which goes up to 13 players, um, a really scalable thing. Um, trying to figure out the, the, the mechanic that works for that is, is kind of the first thing I do. And then the, the process I do is just to convince everyone I can to play it with me, <laughs> which is, I guess that's, that's the, that's the hard part of it. The actual mechanics of it are not as difficult um and i'll uh i guess the first thing i do as well sorry um i i think the steps i do of play testing is number one i get a basic pen and paper kit together so that it'll work um so that you can play test it usually i have a bunch of cards which are pieces of paper that i've written on um and i'll put those into card sleeves um which you can get a, at a game shop um just to make it work at a basic level I'll play a couple of rounds just with myself to try to like m see if it makes sense at a basic level, like playing the different people and seeing how it works. Once I'm happy at it or once like once I can't get any more information out of it by just playing it with myself, that's when I'll start to get more people in and do it as many times as possible. So that, that's a broad outline anyway. I wouldn't go into more detail than that. Yeah, yeah. The only other thing I was going to ask was when you do do those larger groups, um, whether you're run, doing it like a run through of the game on a small scale or just drilling into, like, for example, the combat mechanics or something. Yeah, usually I do a, a play test of just one part of the game by itself. So, like, for God Emperor, I did a lot of play tests of the war map and the um, underground, which was the espionage part of the game. And then I uh, had one big play test where I tested them all together. Um, but obviously that's much more difficult to get together because you need a lot more people. Mm. Uh, so usually I try to make stuff that I can kind of play test on its own and then connect it together. And what's the, I mean, just broadly across God Emperor and, um, oh, you know, uh, We're Not Alone, uh, what is the general outcome of the playtests? How much changes do you make afterwards? Like, uh, are they considerable changes to mechanics or do you overhaul things entirely? What's been your experience? Um, generally, I do a lot of changes in between each playtest. Um, mm. Usually it's not about... Uh, so with playtesting, um, I think uh, it's not really about listening to what people say. It's about more like going with your gut and seeing what is happening in the playtest uh because often the feedback people give uh i guess okay there's two things number one people want to be nice to you they don't want to hurt your feelings <laughs> so usually you're not going to get feedback like oh this is trash this bit didn't work um this system is totally broken you're not going to get that right um so it's <laughs> it's not about listening to what people say to you it's about going with your gut 
and um, and seeing what happens to people. Um, it's important to go in with a set of goals, like what you want to get out of the playtest, and focus only on those, right? So, for example, if you don't care about art yet, and you've just got a bunch of cards which are paper which you've written on, then criticism on the art should not be something you care about. And you'll <laughs> get, like people will say, "Hey, I'm not sure about like the art on this card. It looks a little little goofy." Like you'll get that feedback, right? Um, yeah. That's an obvious example, but another thing, but it, it's really easy to get stuck in the nitty gritty of like, you know, like like questions like uh, in your first play test you really shouldn't care about balance at all. Like if people are like, hmm, I think this card should be $5 instead of $4, like don't care about it, right? Yeah. Like who cares? It can be $4 for today. Just have a set of things like, like um, for God Emperor with my, the big goal I had for um, the war map, for example, um, was I wanted there to be alliances and betrayals. Like, in the game in the board game diplomacy i want people to be able to ally with each other and then betray each other so the first thing the first question i had was okay did people ally with each other and did people betray each other and did that work at a basic level and the rest of the questions like uh did they have too many troops did this cost enough did this you know that doesn't matter at all it's just those three questions um yeah so I guess that's the big thing is going with a clear goal, see if that goal was met and change things appropriately. And usually I do a ton of changes in between each play test. And so I guess the quest, the problem I struggle with more is getting caught in the weeds with all these little changes of like, you know, uh, does this system need one less card or one more, you know, all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff that really doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a really good insight. And it's been similar to my experience as well. I haven't done as much playtesting as I would like. But I think um, what you said about going in with a specific goal and making that clear to the people involved is super important, mm -hmm. super helpful. And yeah. I think also what you said about feedback, um, I think this applies to feedback that you get after a game as well. Um, feedback's always great. And we could probably have a good conversation about this you know, more broadly, but I find it's interesting um, how how I take feedback on, especially after a game or especially after a really in-depth play test where a lot of people have a lot of amazing ideas, um, but they haven't walked through the process that you've gone through in designing the thing. And so there's a lot of, um, like you said, balance. For example, it's not on your on your radar at that at that moment, or yeah. maybe they're gonna they're gonna come up to the you know, obvious um, obvious conclusions of how a mechanic should work or what else you could add on to a mechanic that you've run through and you've play tested and it didn't work and you cut. Um, and it, I find those moments kind of reassuring to me that I'm on the right track because if people are following that thought process the same way I did, um, mm -hmm. it's always sort of gratifying. But um, yeah, no, I think it's a very, it's a pretty in-depth conversation that we could we might be able to have in another episode. Um, we've, we've gone through a lot, um, and I thought it would just be good if we could try and wrap up with a few sort of top tips on, on this design process. Cause we've, uh, while we've, we've talked about a lot of things and a lot of step-by-step, -step, there's a lot of detail that we really could have gone into and we don't want to bore everyone at the moment. Um, but I think, um, having reflected on what we talked about and then going over the thoughts that I had when I was trying to figure out how I do design, I think we've kind of covered some of my key tips. Um, mm. one was that you need to clearly articulate at the start, um, not always like what the game is about. That's great, but you need to articulate what your players are going to be doing in the game and why they are important. Um, yeah. I think that is the most important thing to start with more than a setting or a narrative or some kind of mechanic that you want to see. Those things are fine. And if you have them at the start, put them somewhere and park them and get them ready. But I think it all starts with the players and what they're going to be doing. Absolutely. I mean, it's about the players. That's why it's a game and not a, um, well, if it was a story, it would be about the characters usually, right? Like yeah. it's the same thing here. It's the players should be the most important part of your concept if like for example if you're making if you're thinking about a concept and you're like ah, i really like the lush lore and the history here um that's great but how much of that lore and history affects the players and mm. if it doesn't 
should the game be set in that history instead, right? That's something that's worth thinking about. Yeah, definitely. Um, the other thing that I put down was that you do need to collaborate. It doesn't matter how you do it. Um, like I said, I'm not very good at it and I often do it too late or I do it in too subtle ways, but I think you have to do it one way or another and you need to decide early on when is the right time to bring people in. Um, I think it's just like any creative process. If you can't yeah. just sound, sound, soundboard your ideas, it's, um, you're going to find yourself in a hole, just sort of not seeing things from all the different angles. Uh, That's right. So um, mega games are not a one person, um, job, unfortunately. And I do see this is across all designers but you, like what you're saying is exactly right that if you're on your own and you leave it on your own for too long you can really get stuck in your head and just mm. going over like things that don't necessarily matter and that an outside perspective would tell you like look it, it like stop thinking about this that part <laughs> of it doesn't matter let's let's get up back on track so yeah i would get p other people involved as soon as you can Yep. Super important. Um, the final tip that I would throw in is don't be afraid to throw things out if they're not working or if you're over them or you have decided, you know, they'd be better replaced by something else, you know, talking about teams or roles or me mechanics. And then also just generally don't be afraid to cancel or waylay, um, you know, postpone a project that you're working on. If the game, if you've lost momentum, you don't have that inspiration. We're talking about an idea that you had brewing away for three months, no longer appeals to you. Don't force it. Um, because I feel like from my experience, you waste your time and it's better to come back to it at the right time. Absolutely. Yep. And, um, yeah, look after yourself first, right? <laughs> like <laughs> if you need to cancel uh, a project, do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other sort of high level tips that we've missed or that you think need to be stressed? I think that's the big ones. Um, yeah. So, I mean, um, getting started with a basic idea, getting people involved and um, focusing on the core of what you're excited about in the game. Um, that's it. Yeah, awesome. And um, I think it's fair to say we'd really like to hear from others um, who've done the design process or are thinking about it, or even just players who have always been interested in the design process. If you've got any um, questions, ideas, if you want to let us know that we're doing things wrong or <laughs> you've got a better way to do it, um, hit us up. We're always keen to hear from you. Um, Jack, how can people reach you? Yeah, people can reach me on the Facebook group uh, Brisbane Mega Game or uh, at my website at ashtowngames.com. Yep, and you can find me at the Sydney Mega Gamers. Um, that's hello at sydneymegagamers.com. And we've got the website and we are Sydney Mega Gamers on Facebook and Instagram. Awesome. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Pat. Yeah, no, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll see you next time. Cheers. See you next time. so much for listening uh, catch us next time in two weeks when we'll be doing a debrief and discussion of our mega game we are not alone thanks again